It's going to go well as well as all the bunting and celebrations and the flags and the music. At the very heart of today is a religious service. And Hugh Edwards visited Westminster Abbey to meet the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, the man who, later this morning, will crown King Charles III. I'm just struck, Archbishop, by the fact that it's 70 years since this magical place hosted a coronation. But the world has changed a lot in 70 years. I'm wondering, what was your challenge in crafting a service and a ceremony that reflects those changes? The biggest challenge was that it doesn't look like Gilbert and Sullivan operetta, you know, lots of strange things going on, but that it represents Britain as it is today and gathers collective hopes for the future while holding on to the tradition of the past. That was the challenge. We're in what we call the Coronation Theatre. We're going to start over here yes. with all the chairs of estate, and there'll be a moment at the start of the ceremony where the King and Queen will be here, and they'll be approached by a young person Yes. To underline a theme, what is that? The theme of the whole process of the coronation is service, service in love. It's about the king receives all this authority in order to be a blessing and a servant to the people. I'm bound to say that all eyes, at, certainly at quite a big point, will be focused on this chair, this ancient chair, the coronation chair of St Edward, which is not in the kind of condition that you'd expect a throne to be in, is it? No, it's absolutely amazing. But, and it's a very big but, underneath that. the seat, we have the stone, the, the stone of Schoon. The stone of destiny. This was used for the enthroning of Scottish kings before, I think it was Edward I, nicked it, basically. It went back to Scotland quite rightly in 1996. That's right. With the promise it could come for the coronation. And, of course, it'll go back to Scotland afterwards. This is something we can see. Yes. But there is a very important element in this service ah. and ceremony mm. that you will see because you are performing the anointing with holy oil. But nobody else will see it. There'll be a screen, won't there, built around this chair. Why is that shielded from public gaze? The anointing is the s most sacred moment, and it's between the king and God. It represents the gift of the Holy Spirit of God equipping this very Christian king of deep faith to bear the burden of the crown. You will be placing that crown on the king's head. I will. And you have to do it with great care. I have to do it with great care. <laughs> <laughs> How much practice or rehearsal is there before the lot. event itself? A lot. There's a lot of practice. We obtained a replica of the crown, and um, I've been crowning anything that stood still <laughs> long enough, um, just to get this right. I will also be practising with the real thing and memorising which jewels are on which side. I'll leave that to you. <laughs> but, of course, let's not forget, Archbishop, you're not just crowning one person. You're crowning a king and queen. Absolutely. So, and because the two thrones here remind us of that. And I'm bound to ask you on a maybe a more personal level, you are the person entrusted to crown king and queen. How have you approached this ceremony? Lots of prayer, lots of practice. Hmm. I trust in the God who calls each one of us called me, who calls the king and queen, that in this beautiful Christian service, God will touch us and lead us. Archbishop, I speak on behalf of everyone watching. I know this. Good luck and we wish you well. Thank you very much, Hugh. Thank you very much.